Okay, cool. So just to point out as well, I actually have an OWASP WEAR sticker. So if anyone wants one, they're amazing, so you should get one. Um, so we, oh, does this pointer work? No, that's fine. Um, we are all Equifax, the data behind DevSecOps. So I'm Stefania Chaplin, Solutions Engineer at Sonotype. You can find me yeah, on Twitter, DevStephOps, because I say you can't have DevOps without Steph. And feel free to like, you know, take photos and tweet me. I'll retweet, I'll follow, I'm new to this whole Twitter thing. So, um, who am I? So I went to Manchester Uni, where I mainly did Java. And then I worked at a startup um, uh, in a tech company called Vacancy Soft, where I basically trained myself to do Python. And now I work at Sonotype, which specializes in open source cybersecurity. Um, and the reason that I put this kind of little logo of the world is um, I always get um, calls from clients and they're like, oh yeah, we're using Ansible and Kubernetes and Bamboo and Jenkins and repository. And it's like every other week there's a new buzzword. And I'm like, oh, okay, let me, let me just like do a quick Google and figure out what it is. So I'm basically covering the whole world and I travel a lot as well. So back to my talk. Equifax. So who are Equifax? Equifax are a credit ratings agency. So if, for example, you're going to take out a loan um, or, you know, take out kind of a mortgage or anything like that, um, behind all the high street banks, Equifax are the ones storing your personal information. So name, addresses, occupational history, um, you know, the kind of, you know, all the important stuff. Um, and what happened to them around last March is they got hacked. So 145 million people in the America. And if you think there's about 250, maybe 300 there. Um, so obviously a large proportion. And these, this kind of information, it's not the kind of information that it's like, oh, I can, um, it's fine, I'll just change my date of birth and my name and my occupation history. So one of the immediate effects of this actually was there was a lot of a sudden peak in, in fraud of people trying to take out loans because that's the key information. So what happened? March the 7th. Apache Struts, so they're a software house, they, uh, um, they realized they had a vulnerability. Um, and they're actually one of the good guys because they realize they have a problem and then they do the remediation, the patch, on the same day. That's kind of obvious, but that is not what happens. Sometimes people realize there's a problem, but they don't actually fix it or maybe they don't even realize there's a problem. Whilst with Apache, they find out and they do the patch, so great. So they do all they can do. Um, what happened next? March the 9th, so two days later, Equifax applications were breached through a Struts 2 vulnerability. Um, so that's, yeah, you've got like a, it's two days. Um, ironically, it was actually a who am I command. And you can think of these hackers, they're going around, they're finding Struts sites, who am I? User 72,000, user 300. Admin or root, that's, you know, suddenly dollar signs ringing up. Um, so the issue with Equifax was they did not realize they had been hacked until July 29th. So obviously, that is quite a long period for the hackers to be having a good time. And what you found from about May until August, well, until July 29th, that was the large scale exploit. Initially, there was just the probe, and then once they kind of understood the structure of what they're dealing with, then they started mining for all of these, um, you know, for all this personal information. It wasn't just America, there were about, I think it's 500,000 to a million kind of European, but yeah, mainly, mainly America. And when you look at this graph between March the 7th, when, um, you know, there was the vulnerability, to July 29th, that little green patch just here, Equifax had two days between the hack, um, in between the vulnerability, until they got hacked. So how, especially with a large organization, how can you fix things, you know? How can you do it manually? It's like, oh, okay, there's a new vulnerability with the framework. Okay, let's search every single application in the organization to see, are we using struts two? Are we using struts one? Um, so manual processes, you can't, you know, you can't do it in two days. So what happens at Equifax? They didn't actually announce until September. I think it's, I think September the 9th. Um, and what happened was, um, if it was under GDPR, they would have been fined, I think, $62.9 million. Um, the CEO, CTO, CISO all took early retirement, um, and they lost one third, about $5 billion off their market capitalization. So yeah, kind of, kind of a big deal. 
Um, and the issue is, with this strut, Equifax was not alone. So, March the 7th, strut, uh, you know, I've talked about what happened. March the 8th, NSA reveals Pentagon servers scanned by nation states for vulnerable struts instances. So the strut exploit was published. So one day after, you know, the, there's, a, uh, there's a vulnerability, you know, there's a hack immediately available on the internet. March the 9th, Cisco observes that there are a high number of exploits on the servers. March 10th, Equifax, Canada Revenue Agency, Canada Statistics, and the Japanese GMO Payment Gateway. That was three days in March. So what can you do if you, there's a vulnerability, and there are vulnerabilities coming out every day, um, if, you, if you don't know what you're using in your software, you know, if you're using applications, and how can you remediate? Do you know which version you're using? So what happened next? The rest of the story. Um, March 13th, another Japanese, it was the Japanese um, Power and Japan, Japan Post. April 13th, my birthday, um, India Post. December 17, some of you may have heard the Monero crypto mining, which I'm going to talk about in a bit. Uh, March 2018, India's um, AADHAAR, which is, think about that, that's biometrics. So that's the biometric ID card. And the thing is, you know, once you get your fingerprint hacked, you can't really replace your fingerprint. I was actually reading an interesting article recently about, you know, you talk about master keys. They've actually generated master fingerprints, which there are about 10 different types, and then you can hack everyone's fingerprints, which is just really alarming. Um, and then today, 8,780 companies continue to download the vulnerable version of Strut, which includes 57% of the Fortune 100. So, Taking it back in time a bit, I'm going to talk about um, W. Edwards Deeming, who wrote Out of the Crisis in 1982. So he was quite famous because he worked a lot with the Japanese, um, you know, uh, auto, Japanese car industry, specifically Toyota. And he said, you cannot inspect quality into a product. You have to build it in from the beginning. Like, how about we use good quality parts? <laughs> Or how about we standardize the inputs? Or all these things now, which are so obvious. Back then, it was revolutionary. And if you look at the difference between what Toyota were doing in the like, you know, 80s versus what, not bad naming, but say, for example, Ford were doing, um, what you're finding is when you have good quality inputs standardized, you know what parts are going into what product, um, you end up building quality, um, which um, is obviously a good thing. So. Something we do at Sonotype, we do the state of the software supply chain. And we look at many languages. So yeah, check it out. It's a good read, loads of infographics. Um, and we've been doing this for four years now. So you know, we can really spot some trends. But you ask, what is the software supply chain? So it's kind of, it's very similar to your manufacturing supply chain. So you have your suppliers. So they're your open source project. So that, for example, is Apache. And what they're doing is they're creating these open source components that you can use, you know, Struts, Jackson Datamine, Commons Collection, et cetera. And then what happens? So they're all being kind of created in the cloud. Um, you know, if you want to use them, you're going to store them. You're going to take them and put them in your warehouses. But obviously, in software, those would be your component repositories where you can, you know, cache your open source locally. Then you have your manufacturers, so that would be your software development teams. And what happens, and as I, I speak from experience because I was a developer, we love open source. It's awesome. So what you actually find is we are assembling kind of different pieces together. We're actually the manufacturers making, taking all the open source because I used, to, I used to do Python. I used to do a lot of web scraping. And I was, I remember scraping a site and there were loads of PDFs. And was I going to figure out how to scrape a PDF when I'm used to HTML? Or was I just going to Google scrape PDF Python? All of a sudden, Stack Overflow has given me some open source. Did I think to think what transitive dependencies were involved or licensing? most of the time, but, um, but anyway, you end up, once your developers, your software development teams have assembled all these open source components, they put them in the software applications, which are, you know, your finished goods, which is what you use and ship to market. So we've been, you know, tracking, um, you know, a number of languages for a long time, and what you can see here, in 2011, there were about 150 new open source projects a day. And we looked at NPM, Java, NuGet, PyPy. 
When you get to the end of the chart, 2017, it's nearly 1,100 new projects every single day. And also with that, a lot of companies out there, they like to do whitelist, blacklist, because, you know, it sounds legit. But it's like, does that scale? If there are 1,100 new projects a day, how are you going to maintain that kind of list? Um, and even within that, there's variance. So you've got 10,000 new versions every single day. Um, and, and then about 14 releases a year. And this varies massively. You have some people think, I think it's Netflix, they're releasing multiple times a day. And then you have other projects that are deprecated. You're on the most recent version, and it's 12 years old. Um, so you're like, oh, wow, my software is, might be older than my children. Um, so we, if we look at Java, for example, so Sonotype, we own Maven Central, which you might know if you, if you ever download Java. Um, and what we've seen is 10 years of exponential growth. So 2008, there were 1 billion downloads a year. 2017, that's risen to 87 billion downloads a year. And if you look at, say, the number of developers, it's not like we had 1 million Java developers in 2008 and now we have 87 million. What this is showing is a change in behavior. So developers are using open source. It's quick, it's easy, it's innovative. You get features out faster. That's what we're trying to do. You know, faster, more releases, fail fast, et cetera. And this isn't, this isn't just Java, this is JavaScript as well. So Laurie Voss, he's the C, I think CTO or CEO. Um, anyway, he's kind of the head of NPM, which is the JavaScript repository. And this was back in April, and he said, NPM users downloaded five billion packages in the last seven days. On this day four years ago, that figure was 50 million. That's 10,000% growth. He published a similar chart. I saw it a few months ago, but I forgot to screenshot it. And that number's up to about six and a half million now. So you can see the same kind of exponential growth because people are using open source because, you know, it makes sense. Um, so yeah, I find, I travel, I see big companies, little companies, tech, government, retail, automotive, et cetera. Um, and across a variety of languages, 80 to 90% of modern applications consist of assembled components. So that little, that little, little bit there, that's your original code. And this is, you know, across all languages. And it's not just um, development. So these are, um, these are numbers from Docker Hub. It's not quite to scale because you'll see here, this is 1 million and this is 1 billion and that's not quite 1,000x. But anyway, 1 million, 1 billion, 6 and 12. And you can see the same rise as it's getting more popular. So we're seeing a similar thing in operations. So 80 to 90% of modern operations consist of assembled containers, and everyone's seen the rise of you know, AWS, Azure, um, you know, Kubernetes. It, kinda, it just makes sense. However, not all parts are created equal. So um, we, had a look at uh, we had a look at Java open source components, um, and we saw that there were 122,000 with known vulnerabilities. So we had a look at them and, and looked at the project, looked at any remediation plans, et cetera, and just under 20,000, so 15.8 and one, one in six, had fixed the vulnerability. So you're like, well, good, you fixed it, but then you think, okay, so five and six haven't fixed it. Um, and the issue is even if they fixed it, which is obviously great, um, they took on average mean 233 days, median 119. So they're taking months, they're taking nearly a year to fix these problems. If you think about what happened to Equifax, you had two days. <laughs> um, which brings me, obviously, to Apache. So when they realized they had this vulnerability, like I said, they're the good guys, um, they fixed the vulnerability. They had zero days mean time to remediation. So Apache are doing everything they can do. They're saying there's a problem and there's a patch at the same time. But obviously, there must be a disconnect somewhere if the, you know, there's a patch, but it's not being implemented within you know, production applications. So we had a look at 7,500 organizations. And on average, 170,000 Java components downloaded annually, which 3,500 were unique. So that brings a little bit of a, OK, that's a little bit of version dispersion, but anyway. Um, and of that, 18,000, 11.1% had known vulnerabilities. So what this means is there is a CV, uh, CVE associated with it. Um, there's a vulnerability. There might even be a pre-baked metasploit out there. And people are just downloading it. So it makes us think, OK, are 11.1% of developers secretly trying to hack their own company? 
Um, or are they not getting the information where they need it in their IDE, in source control? Are they just not even aware of security? You know, why, why is this number so high? Um, and the thing is, we spoke to a lot of companies, we survey companies as well, and six in 10 have open source policies. So people are aware they're using open source, it's important, and they, you know, they, they need to obviously have some form of governance. However, it's not working. So um, as I said, we own Maven Central so we can track trends. 2014, 6.2% of um, downloads were vulnerable. So I think, was that one in, I want to say one in 16, but anyway. 2015, dropped a little bit. 2016, 5.5, one in 18. Yes, okay, progress. 2017, we actually re-ran the numbers because no one believed it. 12.1% of every single Java component that was downloaded had a known vulnerability. So that's one in eight. So if you think of the chart before when it said 87 billion downloads a year, that's like 11 billion downloads have known vulnerabilities. There's National Vulnerabilities Database, there's everything. Um, so, you know, why is that happening? I think, personally, I think a lot of the reason it's, uh, what's, well, one of the many reasons is transitive dependencies because a lot of the time you might, I speak, well, I speak from experience, but I would usually look at the top level dependence, you know, the dependency I was declaring. Okay, did I go into the next level? Sometimes. Did I go three levels deep? Not always. If I had done that with every single open source component, it probably would have been quicker to write what I needed to do from scratch than to research four or five levels of transitive dependencies, which kind of defeats the um, case of open source. And like I said, this isn't just Java. So this has taken um, Laurie Voss, so he was from the NPM screenshot before. He did a talk at NPM and the Future of JavaScript in October. And I don't know if there are any JavaScript developers. There's a tool out there, NPM Audit, um, which is great. It's in the terminal. It just gives you, you know, a bit of information as you're developing. Um, and he saw that there are four million scans a week. So obviously people are interested. Um, and of that, 51% um, had vulnerabilities, so just over half. 37% um, had high, and 11% had critical. And critical is normally like the, the, the nines and the tens. So obviously that means you know, easily exploitable. Um, and then a university, they did a study um, looking at front ends of website. They looked at a couple of thousands, and they looked at, you know, for popular frameworks. So handlebars, 87% of handlebars inclusions were vulnerable. jQuery, 37%. There are over 72,000 versions of jQuery. So how do you know which version you're using, or if it's safe? Um, and 40% of Angular inclusions were, were known vulnerable as well. And this is, you know, these are sites on the internet. This is production. So it does make you think, okay, I really hope 87% of Handlebars developers aren't intentionally, you know, putting in RCEs and cross-site scripting, you know, for fun. But um, so what we saw, we had a look at um, kind of over the years. So Heartbleed, some of you may be familiar with um, the ironic thing about that, that on a CVSS score, that was only a five. So the scale goes from zero, well, one to 10. And five is kind of in the middle. If you think about the criticals, those are the nines and the tens, and it's about ease of exploitability. Um, and in 2014, um, you know, as I said, we survey people, 14% have verified a breach related to open source components. 2017, that's risen to 20%. That's one in five. That's like that portion of the room. And then suddenly, 2018, 31%, so almost one in three, suspect or have verified a breach related to open source components. So if you look to your left, and if you look to your right, one of you has probably suspected you've been hacked. And um, so literally, Equifax was not alone. So, okay, this is a bit of, a, bit of a busy slide. I'm gonna talk through it, so just ignore most of it. <laughs> uh, so number one, this is looking at exploit over time. So left pad. This was kind of the first kind of big issue with open source like over the recent years. It happened in March 2016. And what happened is there was a bit of an argument between a, a developer and NPM. It was kind of a, you know, the boy and Goliath kind of thing. And the developer was like, okay, fine. I'm just going to delete everything from, from NPM. What happened, of course, was he, he deleted this little um, application uh, code. Um, I think it was like 12 lines called left pad. And all of a sudden, I think 70,000 builds around the world just failed. Because all that code did was it just moved a little bit of text to the left. And I believe, I think it was like Facebook got affected, Google, like, you know, the big players. So it did spark some questions. Should people be allowed to delete from the public repository if everyone's using it? 
So that was March 2016. Two, three, four. So two and three, two, NPM credentials. So this, you know, credentials is kind of an upcoming thing in this slide, but I'm just going to talk through it. Um, so NPM credentials uh, used by publishers of 79,000 packages were published online or easily compromised by dictionary attacks. And the issue with that is everyone's kind of using open source, especially within transitive. You're not necessarily checking it. So if you have your you know, credentials hacked, you could secretly put in you know, a few lines like, um, and start you know, skimming credit card details. Similarly, typo squatting, that happens a lot. So number three, NPM typo squat, there were 40 intentional malicious packages. There was actually, I don't think it's on, oh yeah, so this happened two weeks ago, it's not on this slide. There was an instance with Python and Colorama. They made it the English spelling, so the right one, but unfortunately they put in a remote code execution attack. Whoops. Um, and then number four, Docker, one, two, three, three, two, one. So these were images with um, kind of intentional crypto mining. Um, number five, typo squatting. The Slovakian government found out about 10 malicious PyPy packages with, um, you know, that were downloaded and had loads of attacks with them. Number six, this is actually quite an interesting one. So it was a fictitious tale um, on Medium. This guy called Gilbertson wrote about, oh yeah, so I'm secretly hacking all of your, um, you know, I'm hacking all of you. And I think it was actually the most read article on Medium because it had a very good title. And it was very fictitious, but it was like, oh, okay, yeah, I've just, I've just made a package. It just changes font, and font is so much fun. It changes the colors. And then, even better, I've got other packages to use it. So I'm now a transitive dependency. So all of a sudden, I'm being downloaded, you know, a couple of hundred times. Well, I'm in a few hundred packages, you know, hundreds if not thousands of times. And all I've got is this little, little bit of code, and, and I'm sending back um, credit card information. And it's a really good article, because then, then it says the devil's advocate, oh, no, but I have pen testers. You're going to be catching me. And the answer is, OK, we're pen testing between, you know, what time do your pen testers work? I'm only operating between 7 PM and 7 AM. OK, I might not get all the traffic. But, um, you know, are you going to catch me? And anyway, it's a really good article because it literally, by the end of it, I was like, oh my god. And at the bottom it said, okay, this is totally fictitious, but it wouldn't necessarily be. And what you've seen is there have been recent attacks as well that have taken elements of that because it is, when you stop and look, it is a little bit terrifying. <laughs> um, so yeah, just the last few ones. Number seven, it was another NPM credentials. It was installed 28,000 times in 35 hours and executed another Monero crypto mining. Um, you also had, so this was interesting. So this was in Go. Um, and what happened, someone deleted their account. Fine. Someone else quickly was like, okay, let me put that, let me take the same name, Go Bind Data, and then have the, the same open source packages. But if someone deletes an account, should someone else be able to easily populate it? Because you might put in, you know, intentionally vulnerable stuff, have like sneaky backdoors, et cetera. Like, oh, I want to know your environmental variables, et cetera. Um, and then this kind of happened. So number nine, backdoored NPM. Um, what happened is someone um, in NPM, it was a cookie passing library, and they, I think, oh yeah, they published in March 18 to introduce unauthorized publishing of mail parser. And even though they were deprecated, they were getting 64,000 weekly downloads. Even though it was known they were bad, don't go here, you're going to get backdoored. And this happened in number 10, backdoored PyPy as well. So this is an SSH decorator. I had to triple check before this talk, SSH. I was like, you know, security shell. Um, so this is people that care about security. I always find those the most ironic when people affect cryptographic libraries because I'm like, okay, I care about security, um, so I'm going to use this vulnerable library that, <laughs> that I'm going to get hacked with. Um, and then, I don't know, this was more recent, so August 18, there was a homebrew breach. So especially people um, that do not like to use the UI, homebrew is a great way of getting things installed. Um, so someone, you know, I, I'm going to say a, a white hat, someone who is nice, um, managed to gain commit access to Homebrew in 30 minutes using an exposed GitHub API. Um, so he had no malicious intent, so it was fine, but he could have easily done something that is downloaded half a million times a month. Okay, I'm so glad I'm over that slide. This is the first time presenting it. It's very busy anyway. I'm moving on. <laughs> so let's look at some real life examples. Bouncy Castle. So that's actually a cryptographic Java library. As I said, ironic, because people that care about Bouncy Castle are people that care about security. So 2007, 
there was a vulnerability discovered and it had a score of 10.0. And it's a funny joke with me and my colleagues, when we find a 10.0, we like take a photo and we're like, guys, guys, I found a perfect 10. Because they don't come along that often. It's quite hard to score, you know, 10.0. Um, 2016, nine years later, so the vulnerability has been around all that time, there were 23 million downloads of which 11 million were vulnerable. So nearly 50% of all the downloads of this cryptographic library were vulnerable. <laughs> um, similarly, Commons Collection, so this is great for deserialization. Um, 24 million downloads in 2016. 18 million, 78%, so just over three and four, were vulnerable. And ironic about this, there are 35 versions. Only seven are vulnerable. So that's 20% of the, of the numbers of version makes up nearly 80% of the downloads, because, like I said, really popular. Um, I don't know if you recognize in the background. So this is a picture of the Hollywood Presbyterian um, Hospital. And I know we've been talking, you know, vaguely about, okay, credit card details and backdooring and typo squatting and, you know, techie stuff. Um, so what happened to Hollywood um, Hospital? They got hacked. And the issue is when you start hacking a hospital and blocking them out of all their systems, what happens to the patients that need surgery? Or what happens to people that are coming in that then have to be diverted three hours to the next hospital? So it becomes an issue of moving from you know, money and our laptops to literally life and death. And there's also the thing, Internet of Things. Internet of Things, you've got your pacemaker. It's a great idea to have Wi-Fi to, to go to the hospital if, you get, you know, if you've got a heart attack. But what happens if the doctors putting, or the people making these applications aren't thinking, OK, is my Wi-Fi secure? Could I hack people's pacemakers and literally make them stop? So all of a sudden, as I said, it's becoming more of a human element and kind of almost life and death. So recent outbreak, I think it was about two weeks ago, um, CVE 2016-100031. So on the 5th of November, Apache said, hey, guys, we're really sorry. If you're using version 2336 and prior, um, you are vulnerable to a remote code execution attack. Um, the, th the thing is with struts, like I said, they're the good guys. They realize they've got a problem and then they publish it. What was different about this is it wasn't in the struts. It was in one of their transitive dependencies. So actually, it was within commons file upload. So if, you kind of, if you've seen the announcement, it tells you you need to update this dependency. Or obviously, if you upgrade struts, it's using the more recent version. The thing about it is, so I had a look at some of the references. So you can see number two, NVD took a screenshot. This has actually been out since 2016. So if you are using commons file upload, um, yeah, you've got a remote code execution. But surely, if you're using struts and it's pulling in commons file uploads, then shouldn't you know what transitive dependencies you're using and be able to check to see if they're vulnerable and not use them if they're vulnerable? Um, and the slight issue with this is security by press release can be detrimental. Because if all of a sudden you're just following the latest, oh, there's a new outbreak in struts, oh, but it's from 2016, it can actually take away a lot of time and energy for the more you know, recent and pressing things. So why don't we just you know, have security as important you know, as it comes? Let's, you know, let's just be safe, but maybe, I don't know, I'm naive. Um, so going back to struts and you know, what happened to Equifax. So this is like another version of the timeline from the first bit of my slide. So March 17. Struts vulnerability was announced. You'd expect, OK, there's a problem. You'd expect, OK, there was a bit of a dip. But then it kind of goes back up, goes, OK, this is when Equifax discovered there was a problem. Yeah, the breach disclosed. It's, OK, it's uh, statistical noise. It's averaging 80,000 vulnerable struts downloads a month. And you can see 12 months since the Equifax breach, OK, it goes up and down by maybe like 10 15%. But when there are vulnerabilities published, this isn't affecting behavior. Because otherwise, if someone said, you know, say, for example, um, you know, back in the 90s, mad cow disease, everyone stopped eating beef. Imagine if it was like that with kind of software. It's like, oh, this is a vulnerable component. Let's, you know, let, let's change. Let's remediate. But you know, this graph shows yeah, it's not, the behavior is not affected. So this was some research done by Gartner and IBM. And they said in 2006, you had about 45 average days to exploit. So you've got a while, like, hey, there's a vulnerability. You know, in that case, Equifax would have been nearly safe. They took more like you know, two and a half months or whatever. 
But you see that number gradually dropping over time because there are new attack vectors. You know, there's literally a Google search you can do to see if people are using struts. It's like, file action, do something, ask me later, I'll find it. Um, but it's actually terrifying how easy it is. And especially with these um, hackers, they can just, you know, set up little, um, set up scripts to just, you know, mine the internet. Who's using struts? Let's see if we can remote code execute. So what you're ending up with, so Equifax, all of a sudden, three. So how can you, how can you remediate? How can you, you know, be safe? If you've only got three days to do it, you know, manual processes really don't work. You need to have some way of automating, at least know what open source components you are using. So, Gene Kim, the Phoenix Project, um, some of you may, may have known his book, um, and what he said, you have to emphasize performance of the entire system and never pass a defect downstream. Um, you know, easier said than done, but it's so true. So our CEO, he likes to talk about tributaries, tribute, tribute, rivers and reservoirs. <laughs> um, and what he says, if you're going to have polluted rivers, you're going to end up with a polluted res reservoir. Um, and it's the same thing. If you realize that you're developing and you're using a bad component, are you going to just leave it in and let it slide into production? Or why don't you just fix it there and, and not just, you know, um, pass the problems? So what happens when you do reduce your downstream defects? So if we look back at our um, manufacturing, um, software manufacturing, so you know, warehouses, manufacturers, finished goods, once you start managing your software supply chain, so you know, doing security checks, seeing what you're using, looking at transitive dependencies, looking at vulnerabilities, remediating, you know, the, the simple stuff. Um, when you look versus unmanaged versus managed, there was a 48% improvement in application quality. And also, speaking to, you know, um, speaking to organizations, the rewards are impressive. So there was an investment bank, and they saw a 90% improvement in time to deploy. Because, you know, all of a sudden, there aren't any manual bottlenecks. You know, there's no more waiting, you know, six weeks to literally enter an IP address. What you're seeing is, you know, just quicker, easier, faster. And they reduced it from 25 days to 2.5 days. I still ask myself what they're doing for 2.5 days, but that's a different question. Similarly, um, 34,000 hours saved in 90 days. This was a credit card company, and you know, you know the normal process. Hi, I'm a developer, I'd like to use a component. Hi, I research components, let, let me put it in the list, let me look through. Three weeks later, Yes, yes, you can use that component. By which point, I have either, well, written my own code, or obviously not me, but um, I put it on a USB drive, named it Stefania Good, and you know, got, it in my uh, got it in my application somehow. But all of a sudden, if you start automating, realizing what you're doing, eliminating manual processes, 34,000 hours saved in 90 days, which I haven't actually, I always mean to work out what is that in relation to someone's working career, but you know, a large proportion. And like I said, 48% increase in application quality. So, three takeaways. What can you do? Have a software bill of material for each application so you know what open source software you are using. Um, I know this sounds, sounds simple, but if you were going to say, okay, especially JavaScript, I've, you know, the, no, the nested node modules. So, do you know every single open source component within your within your application, you know, how, how many depths of dependencies have you got, et cetera. Number two, shift left, empower developers by giving them information into their IDEs and source control. Um, there are statistics out there. Um, some people say 100, for every 100 developers, there's one security expert. I've heard different people say it's more like 300 to one. So why don't we use that resource? Why don't we empower developers? Developers are much happier when they're like, oh, that's bad, let me put in a good version, and then it moves away, rather than let me just develop, and then three weeks later, oh yeah, please change that, there's a cross-site scripting, or a record execution, or file traversal, and I'm like, context switching. Not speaking from personal experience or anything, but... Um. <laughs> and number three, I think most importantly, add checks at every stage to ensure you don't pass defects downstream. Um, because, for example, depending on your release cycles, um, between when you develop to when you build to when you deploy, maybe it's a day, maybe it's a week, maybe it's six months, but vulnerabilities come out every day. So it's important to check that there aren't new vulnerabilities coming out. 
Um, so I'm Stefanie Chaplin, Solutions Engineer. You can find me on LinkedIn. If you want my slides, you can email me. You can probably get them from OWASP. I think I'm being filmed. And if you want, find me on Twitter or just find me afterwards and you can ask me questions. And that's the end. Excellent. Thank you very much, Stefania. <laughs>